a teenage girl is found murdered in her Indiana home. And police soon suspect that she is not this killer's only victim. Detectives race the clock to track a serial killer across the country before he strikes again. Someone is targeting elderly women in a gated California community. With no witnesses and little physical evidence, investigators struggle to find a link between the murders. For homicide investigators, it's difficult to predict when and where a serial killer will strike next. But with the help of forensic examiners, they can isolate tiny clues that can lead them to the killer who is driven by bloodlust. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. An hour's drive south of Chicago, Griffith, Indiana is home to 18,000 people. People drawn here by the quiet lifestyle and the low crime rate. Hey, Wendy. Hey, Around 7 p.m. on October 13, 1987, 15-year-old Christine Gallagher returned home from school. I believe what happened at the swim meet today. She called out to her older sister, Wendy, but there was no response. Hey, Wendy. Though Mrs. Gallagher was still at work, Wendy should have been home from school hours ago. Christine checked the bedroom. Oh my, Wendy. There, she found 16-year-old Wendy's Wendy. lifeless body on the floor. Griffith police and crime scene units were immediately dispatched to the Gallagher apartment. The distraught teenager was taken to a squad car as police made their way into the residence. Inside the apartment, the living room was neat and orderly. But in the bedroom, police discovered the gruesome scene. The semi-nude victim had been gagged, her hands tied behind her back with a bedsheet. She'd been stabbed repeatedly. It appeared that she had been sexually assaulted, but no biological evidence was recovered. For Lieutenant John Mowry of the Griffith Police Department, the scene was difficult to comprehend. When I walked into that apartment and saw the victim, Wendy Gallagher, and saw the savage manner in which she had been killed, I've never seen anything like that. I, I was on the department 17 years prior to that, have investigated other homicides. I've never seen anything that even comes descriptively close to the way that scene was. Investigators began to methodically process the scene. Next to the window, they discovered blood spatter on the wall and curtain. Hoping to find prints, they treated the wall with silver nitrate, a chemical that reacts to the oils found in fingers and palms. Then they scanned the area with a light source. A partial palm print and more blood spatter emerged. The section of wall was removed and forwarded to the crime lab. In the living room, investigators collected a drinking glass with smudged fingerprints. They also found a denim jacket hanging on the back of a chair. Searching the pockets, they found a driver's license. It belonged to a teenage boy with a local address. Run a check on that part. 
On the kitchen counter, detectives recovered a woman's purse. There was no identification inside. Outside, Christine told police that her father had dropped her off after a school swim meet. She said that since their parents' recent divorce, she and Wendy would sometimes be by themselves after school until Mrs. Gallagher returned from work soon after. As Christine continued answering questions, one of the investigators brought out the purse found in the kitchen. Let me, let me show you something. Christine said it was hers. She added that when she arrived home, she didn't remember seeing Wendy's purse anywhere. Then, Mrs. Gallagher returned from work and learned about the murder. Overwhelmed with grief, she told police she couldn't believe anyone would want to kill her daughter. Wendy was such a beautiful and cheerful girl. When shown the ID from the denim jacket, the Gallaghers recognized the boy immediately. He was Wendy's boyfriend. Looking for any clue to the killer's identity, examiners at the Lake County Crime Lab began to analyze the prints recovered from the Gallagher apartment. They started with a smudged drinking glass. When dusted with black powder, two distinct sets of fingerprints were revealed. Analysis of the arches, whorls, and loops that makes each print unique established that one set was Wendy's. But the second set of prints didn't match any of the Gallagher's. Next, examiners turned to the section of wall removed from Wendy's bedroom. To preserve the fragile drywall, they worked from photographs. Again, the partial palm print didn't match samples taken from any of the Gallagher's. Its position on the drywall in relation to the blood found around the window led evidence technician Ronald Latch to conclude that whoever left it had been startled. He put one hand on the wall and looked out the curtain because you could see blood on the edge of the curtain and on the wall and looking out to see if somebody was coming. Maybe he heard a voice or a car door slam. But the concern must have been short-lived. Crime scene analysis uncovered no signs of a forced entry or exit. It appeared that after committing this brutal murder, the killer calmly left the apartment, probably through the front door. Convinced that the unidentified prints were the key to revealing the killer's identity, investigators ran them through APHIS, a computer database that holds millions of fingerprint records. But no matches were found. Detectives turned to Wendy's boyfriend for answers. They wanted to know why his jacket and ID were found in the Gallagher's apartment. The teenager explained that Wendy had been cold that day at school. He'd loaned her his jacket and she'd worn it home. He said he was home with his parents during the time of the murder. He also told police he had no idea who could have hurt Wendy. She was very popular at school, where she was an honor student and a pom-pom girl. He said Wendy was a lot of fun to be with, and he couldn't believe she was gone. I was in the back of the class. I'm going to go get this folder over. Though he had a solid alibi, detectives fingerprinted him before letting him go. 
but analysis of his prints later confirmed his innocence. Police spent the next several days interviewing dozens of Windy's friends and neighbors. Over 50 potential suspects were developed, but fingerprint analysis eliminated all of them. According to Detective Carl Grimmer, tensions in the small town grew as the investigation hit a dead end. Within the community of Griffith after this occurred, there was a lot of fear. Um, we didn't know who we were looking for. We didn't know if we were looking for somebody that lived in our town, somebody in a neighboring town, or if it could have been a drifter. But a week after the murder, police got a solid lead. A woman in Chicago had found Wendy's missing purse. I understand you uh, found a purse that we were been looking for. The purse somehow ended up in my purse. I had she explained that her own purse had been snatched during an assault. The purse actually ended up in mine. Yes, when it was later recovered from a dumpster and returned, she opened it and found Wendy Gallagher's purse and ID stuffed inside. Then she'd heard about the murder in Griffith. I was walking home down an alley and this, this car pulls up. The woman said that as she left work through the back door, a man with brown hair and a mustache jumped out of a blue car. He grabbed her and threatened her with a knife. As they struggled, a delivery truck pulled up. Panicked, the assailant grabbed her purse and fled. But he had left behind valuable evidence. A witness who could identify him and a physical link to Wendy's murder. Police quickly released a composite sketch of the suspect, along with a description of his blue car. Over the next several weeks, they received many leads as a result, but none of them panned out. Despite the lack of progress, investigators refused to give up. Everybody who had walked into that crime scene that night and saw Wendy, uh, that's all the incentive you needed to keep going, to find out who had done that to her. Griffith detectives had a composite sketch and fingerprints that could prove murder. But until they could identify their suspect, that evidence was meaningless. And all indications suggested that Wendy Gallagher was not going to be this killer's last victim. Several months had passed with little progress in the murder case of 16-year-old Wendy Gallagher. Though Griffith, Indiana police had a composite drawing of their suspect and prints recovered from the murder scene, his identity and his whereabouts remained unknown. As they struggled to keep the case alive, an improbable lead was called in by police in Pasco County, Florida, located more than 1,100 miles away from Griffith, Indiana. While investigating the homicide of a 14-year-old girl there, Florida police believed that a resident had uncovered a connection to Wendy Gallagher's unsolved murder. Who was your lead detective on this case? That resident, Diane Collins, had just moved to Pasco County from Griffith, Indiana. As details of the Florida murder were made public, Diane immediately noticed similarities to the homicide in Griffith. The frighteningly familiar details compelled her to contact the police. I was very much struck by the fact that this was another young teenage girl who was murdered in her home um, after school hours, just as um, Wendy was in the community I had just left. Griffith police were skeptical that such a tenuous lead could impact their case, but they had little else to go on. They asked Pasco County investigators to forward the case files. According to police reports, in January 1988, 14-year-old Janet Clark was discovered in her bedroom by her younger brother shortly after 6 p.m.
He and Mr. Clark had just returned home from running an errand. Janet had been home from school just a few hours. When police arrived, they found Janet's partially clad body gagged and bound, her hands tied together with a bed sheet. She'd been viciously knifed and raped. No prints had been found at the scene. And while DNA evidence was recovered during autopsy, investigators had no suspect to link it to. But now, Griffith detective Carl Grimmer realized that Diane Collins' instincts might have been dead on. We thought it was a long shot that the two cases could be connected. But when we, we sat and studied the photos, studied the crime scenes, we became stronger and stronger in our belief that they probably were connected. It's just, you had to see it to see the similarities. It's almost like there was a signature. Believing they were now searching for the same killer, the two departments began exchanging information. Pasco County, Florida police intensified their investigation. One of the Clark's neighbors recalled a man in the neighborhood around the time of Janet's murder. She had never seen him before. She described the man to a police sketch artist as being in his late 20s with dark hair and a mustache. She believed that he was driving a late model red Corvette with Missouri license plates. Though the description of the vehicle was different, Griffith police couldn't ignore the striking similarities to their suspect. For Detective Maury, there was little doubt that a serial killer was on the loose. Time definitely was our enemy. We knew from what we had seen thus far how savage this person was. So we were, we were virtually racing against a clock. We wanted to apprehend him as quickly as we could to prevent him from hurting anybody else. But police knew that tracking a multi-state killer would be difficult. Until he struck again, all they could do was wait. And they feared this killer wouldn't make them wait very long. Two months later, police in Beaumont, Texas responded to reports of gunfire at a local motel. Responding officers burst into the room where the shots had been heard. There, they discovered one of their own, Officer Paul Halsey, unconscious, the victim of a gunshot wound. The fallen officer had notified dispatch just a few minutes before that he was checking on the driver of a stolen vehicle who had just entered one of the rooms. Officer Halsey was rushed to the hospital but his injuries proved fatal. He died a short while later. A witness at the motel stated that he heard gunfire and looked out his window. He saw a man with dark hair and a mustache speed away in a red Corvette. All points bulletin was issued for the red sports car. And within a few minutes, dispatchers reported that the vehicle had been spotted. The sports car was able to elude police for more than 20 miles. But the driver suddenly lost control and the car swerved off the road. He fled into a wooded area on foot and disappeared. Texas authorities began preparing their manhunt for a suspected cop killer. While police in Indiana and Florida struggled to track down a serial killer who preyed upon young girls, 
Police 2,000 miles away in Beaumont, Texas, were on the trail of a suspected cop killer. Though the suspect had managed to escape, police had his abandoned red Corvette. How are you doing? All right. Inside, they recovered a blood-stained 357 Magnum that had been recently fired. 357. They also found stolen license plates, including a set from Missouri. Now their focus was on finding the driver. Detective Ray Beck of the Beaumont Police Department organized the manhunt. The word was out. So we had officers coming in from everywhere, just volunteering their time, their effort. So manpower was unbelievable. Through witnesses, police learned that the suspect had jumped into a taxi and was headed toward Houston. Officers quickly caught up with the cab. Taxi driver, get out of the car. Taxi passenger, get your hands up. The man believed responsible for the murder of Officer Halsey was taken into custody. Get your hands up. Get out of the car. Get your hands where I can see them. Turn around. Move here on the truck. The suspect, identified as 28-year-old Michael Lee Lockhart, was questioned at the Beaumont Police Station. He immediately confessed to shooting Officer Halsey, but offered no explanation. It seemed too easy. Robert Hobbs, an investigator with the Jefferson County District Attorney's Office, recalls Lockhart's interview. He was very calm, he was very collected. We knew right away that we were, um, that this was not our typical criminal in Southeast Texas, uh, and that we would have our work cut out for us. Their instincts told them Lockhart wouldn't have killed a police officer over a stolen car. There had to be more, a lot more, to this murder. Investigators fingerprinted Lockhart and collected hair samples. He was held without bond on capital murder charges. Ballistics results, bolstered by Lockhart's confession, gave Beaumont detectives an airtight case. But Lockhart's quick confession still seemed too calculated, as if he might be trying to head off further investigation. Evidence recovered from Lockhart's motel room indicated he'd been on the move for months. Police had recovered several hotel and restaurant receipts from throughout the Midwest. But what was he running from? Hoping to find out, Detective Ray Beck wrote an article profiling Lockhart and details of Officer Halsey's murder for a national law enforcement magazine. The tactic paid off. A detective working the Janet Clark murder in Pasco County, Florida, read the article on Lockhart and Officer Halsey's murder. He then called the Beaumont Police Department. Detective Beck quickly understood why. One of the missing links to their case was the fact that their red Corvette had Missouri license plates. And that was one of the pieces of evidence that we had here was uh, Missouri license plates that we found in the Corvette. Detective Beck next learned about the connection to Wendy Gallagher's murder. Investigators working that case in Griffith, Indiana were immediately notified. They requested that Lockhart's prints be forwarded to the Lake County Crime Lab. Hoping they had the evidence they needed to prove murder, examiners went to work, comparing Lockhart's fingerprints to those recovered from the Windy Gallagher crime scene. After scrutinizing and comparing both sets of prints, examiner Ronald Latch was certain that Windy's killer had been found. The fingerprints we found at the scene put Michael Lee Lockhart 
in that apartment and the palm prints put them right next to the body of the victim where there was blood and on the curtain in the wall. Nearly eight months after Wendy Gallagher was found murdered in her home, investigators finally had the evidence they needed to charge Michael Lee Lockhart with her murder. I felt a great sense of relief because I knew that he couldn't commit any more crimes. And I also felt happy that we would be able to contribute and help bring some semblance of closure to the Gallagher family. On June 30th, 1988, DNA analysis confirmed that Lockhart had murdered and sexually assaulted Janet Clark in Florida. Working together, three police agencies had tied three seemingly unrelated murders to one predator. Based on the evidence, police believe that Lockhart traveled the country in search of his next victim. Hey, those are right down the road. Can I use your He would prowl an area, hunting for vulnerable young victims. When he knew they were alone, he would con his way into their homes where he would rape and murder them. Michael Lee Lockhart stood trial for murder in all three states. He was sentenced to death in each trial. In Texas, on December 9, 1997, Michael Lee Lockhart was executed for his crimes. It took the cooperative effort of three police departments to track a transient serial killer across the United States. But sometimes, murderers who stay in one place are just as hard for investigators to find. 75 miles from Los Angeles, Riverside County, California is a haven for retirees and people looking to escape the problems of urban life. But on February 16, 1994, a 911 call brought police from the Riverside County Sheriff's Office to a condo in the upscale community of Canyon Lake. There, investigators found the body of 86-year-old Norma Davis slumped in an easy chair. A phone cord was wrapped around her throat and knives protruded from her chest and neck. Investigators began searching the scene, looking for anything that could tell them who had murdered Norma Davis and why. Robbery appeared to be an unlikely motive. The victim still wore an expensive ring on her finger. It's expensive as that ring is. A few desk drawers were open, but there were no signs of ransacking. Forensic technicians processed the body, looking for any stray hairs or fibers that the killer may have left behind. But from the position of the body, it was clear to California Department of Justice criminalist Elisa Mayo Thompson that there was little interaction between the victim and killer. She appeared to just be sitting in her chair as if she were perhaps reading or watching TV. It didn't appear that she had made much of a struggle or had attempted to get up from that chair. Yeah. That told got... investigators that Norma Davis most likely knew her killer. The knives were removed and sent to the crime lab to be tested for prints. A search of the condo confirmed that robbery was not a motive. On the kitchen floor, investigators found Norma's purse, still containing credit cards and cash. In the hallway, investigators spotted a faint shoe print on the floor. To get a better look, the room was darkened. Closer examination revealed that it was a sneaker print left in dust and recovering such fragile evidence would be tricky. But in a crime scene that yielded few clues to the killer's identity, the print could prove to be a vital piece of evidence. 
After thoroughly photographing the print, technicians carefully applied an adhesive gelatin to lift it. But the minute details of the print didn't survive the lift. It would be up to examiners to determine if there was a sufficient sample to do future comparisons when and if a suspect emerged. Outside, detectives talked to Alice Williams, who had found the victim. She stated that she had come over to pick up Norma for their weekly hair appointment. She let herself in when Norma didn't respond to her calls. That's when she discovered the body. She couldn't understand how such a thing could have happened in Canyon Lake. It was a gated community with round-the-clock security. Norma's ex-daughter-in-law, Mary Pierce, had also arrived at the scene. She too lived in Canyon Lake. She told investigators that she and Norma were very close. But as Mary continued describing Norma in greater detail, detectives glanced down and noticed she was wearing Nike sneakers. They asked if there was anyone close to Norma who would want her dead. Mary reacted with shock, insisting no relative could possibly be involved. But now, detectives weren't so sure. They turned to the crime lab for answers. But criminalists at the California Department of Justice Forensic Lab determined that all of the evidence recovered from the condo had been wiped clean of prints. One of those stains could have come from her. There were no stains. They hoped the recovered shoe print could lead them to Norma's killer. For Ricky Eldon Cooksey, a criminalist with the Department of Justice Crime Lab in Riverside, Shoe print evidence can carry investigators a long way. A shoe print collected at the crime scene can help the investigators if we can identify what kind of shoe made that print and there are data banks that store that type of information. We can tell them what type of shoe they're looking for and size shoe they're looking for. After reviewing hundreds of different sneaker tread designs, Cooksey believed that the print recovered from Norma Davis's home had been made by a Nike. He acquired a similar sneaker from the manufacturer and made test prints. The tread design was identical. Cooksey had determined that the suspect's print had been made by a size six and a half Nike Air tennis shoe. For detectives, the news was not that encouraging. I'll talk to you later. Tracking down a specific purchase of such a popular shoe would be next to impossible. Thank you. The only thing that homicide detective Joe Greco could infer from the analysis was that the suspect was a small male or possibly a woman. And he already had a potential suspect who fit that description. Goodbye. We suspected the ex-daughter-in-law Mary Pierce because of the, the shoes that she was wearing when she came to the crime scene and the brand of shoe matched the brand of shoe that we found in the doorway. And uh, also, she was the caretaker. She was the obvious choice. Thanks, Jerry. Police questioned Mary Pierce so in greater detail, carefully watching her demeanor. She, she would take her medicine? Mary said her ex-mother-in-law was a wonderful, warm person who didn't have any enemies. Most days, she just watched her TV or read. She was just a risk. After answering dozens of questions, was. it became clear to investigators that Mary was not involved in Norma's murder. Okay, sure her cooperation and her grief were sincere. Please call. Okay, thank you. I sure will. I appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Detectives reviewed dozens of statements given by Norma's family, friends, and neighbors. But no one had any useful information. The case quickly threatened to go cold. With no suspects and no solid leads, it looked like Norma Davis's murder 
might never be solved. In Riverside, California, the investigation into the stabbing and strangulation death of 86-year-old Norma Davis, killed in her Canyon Lake home, had ground to a halt. Attention units, we have a possible homicide. As investigators struggled to keep the case alive, another 911 call came in from residents of Canyon Lake. Another elderly woman had been found murdered in her home. There, police discovered 66-year-old June Roberts, dead on her office floor. And for everyone in the room, this crime scene looked disturbingly familiar. Though June Roberts had not been stabbed, she still wore an expensive ring and had a phone cord wrapped around her neck. Credit cards were scattered around her purse, but nothing appeared to be missing. For criminalist Alyssa Mayo Thompson, it was obvious that June Roberts and Norma Davis's murders were connected. The type of crimes, both brutal homicides occurring within a few short days of between each other in this area, led us to think that these two crimes may be linked. Investigators scoured the home. A Bible caught detectives' attention. Inside was a handwritten prayer list. Norma Davis's name was on that list. The two victims were friends. But for Detective Greco, how they were connected to the killer was unclear. He could be certain about one thing, however. A serial killer was targeting elderly women in Canyon Lake. This whole case is overwhelming in that it's not something that, that one in law enforcement comes across every day. It's, it's, it's a crime of, a, of serious violence, and, and it wasn't stopping. I mean, it was just the beginning. And so far, this killer had made few mistakes. But a week after June Roberts' death, that all seemed to change. June Roberts' daughter brought police a statement from one of her mother's credit card companies. Someone had gone on a spending spree immediately after June's death, charging jewelry, clothing, and other merchandise. It was the break detectives were waiting for. Now they had a paper trail to follow. They started at a jewelry store, where the first purchase with the murdered victim's card had been made. The clerk vaguely recalled the transaction. She remembered that a blonde woman came into the store and purchased an expensive set of earrings. The woman charged the items and signed her name, June Roberts. The clerk couldn't provide enough detail for a composite sketch but she gave investigators a Xerox copy of an identical pair of earrings. The blonde woman, whoever she was, had been linked to one of the victims. The next purchase on June Roberts' credit card came from a hair salon. A stylist there remembered the woman claiming to be June Roberts. She said the woman was in her mid-30s with shoulder-length blonde hair, hazel eyes, and a medium build. She added that the woman had a young boy with her. According to her appointment book, his name was Jonathan Weaver. An artist was brought in to translate the stylist's description of the blonde woman into a composite sketch. Gradually, a face took shape. Yes. What would you change about But police still didn't know how this woman fit into the murders. And they had no way to put a name to her face. 
pursuing their only other lead, investigators began searching for the young boy, Jonathan Weaver, who had been at the hair salon with the blonde woman. It's very similar. Yeah. They contacted area public schools and found a child with that name. They went to his address and waited. But when they spotted the boy and his mother arriving home, they realized the mother didn't resemble any of the descriptions. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. How you doing, Questioning son? confirmed that the boy had never been to that salon. Not at all. And neither recognized the woman in the composite. No, I've never seen her. Despite the setback, investigators refused to give up. The locations of the murders and the credit card purchases were all within a five-mile radius of each other. Investigators knew their killer had to be hiding right under their noses. She made more purchases there. Yeah, she made uh, that on this one. Hoping to generate a lead, they decided to run a check of all violent crimes recently reported within that same area. The tactic turned up a possible clue. An elderly woman who owned an antique shop just blocks away from Canyon Lake had been recently assaulted. And this young woman came in. Dorinda Hawkins, still recovering in the hospital, had barely survived the attack. She told investigators that a blonde woman came into her antique shop to ask about framing. When she led the customer into the back to show her some samples, the woman suddenly attacked her from behind. Dorinda felt a rope tightening around her neck. She had a, a rope around my neck. She told detectives that she then began begging for her life. Called 911. You know, you can have whatever you want, take whatever you want. I have eight children, let me live. And uh, the suspect told her, uh, I'm not doing this for the money. Dorinda had been left for dead, but she managed to regain consciousness. When she came to, her red coiled key band that held the keys to the cash register was missing from her wrist. And money from the register was also gone. When shown the composite, she positively identified the blonde as her assailant. It, does. it was now apparent to investigators that the suspect was not simply an accessory to the other crimes. She was the serial killer. And the rarest type of all, a woman. Investigators raced to put a name with the face on the composite sketch. Since Mary Pierce had known both of the murder victims, Police hoped she might have also crossed paths with the killer. No, 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 this won't take long at all. Let me ask you this. Can you put a name to this face? Does this look familiar? When shown the sketch, Mary said that the face kind of resembled her stepdaughter, Dana Sue Gray. Dana Sue Gray, that's my stepdaughter. As Mary described her stepdaughter, the pieces started to fall into place. The information fit the description of the suspect that I was looking for in that uh, she had a key to the first victim's house. She knew the second victim. Um, she, uh, she had a pass to get into Canyon Lake. And uh, she, was, she was familiar with the area. Mary added that okay. Dana owned a house in Canyon Lake. So you do know those? Two? But Dana had just gone through a vicious divorce battle and was trying to sell the place because of the resulting financial ruin. Her job as a registered nurse was not enough to support the affluent lifestyle she had come to enjoy. The positive identification of the sketch and the information provided by Mary Pierce led detectives to obtain a warrant to search Dana Sue Gray's property. But that would take time. And given the suspect's propensity for violence, they didn't want to give her a chance to kill again. Undercover officers immediately put her under surveillance. Riverside County investigators 
continued looking into Dana Sue Gray's background. They learned that she was currently dating a man who had a young child named Jonathan Weaver, the same name as the child who had been at the hair salon. But this Jonathan Weaver was enrolled in private school. You remember that? Previously, detectives had only searched public school records. Later that afternoon, one of the officers picked up Dana's trail in nearby Sun City as she entered a bank. She's going to the bank right now. When she left a few minutes later, Dana was seen stuffing a large amount of cash into her purse. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and a few hours later, Riverside police had obtained their search warrant. Detective Greco briefed the team on the items of evidence they were looking for once they made their way inside the suspect's house. We had receipts from the, the different locations that the purchases were made for these various items, so they knew exactly what they were looking for. Also, I had directed the, uh, the searchers to uh, collect all of the shoes within the residence because of the, obviously, the, the first victim's, uh, the shoe print in the first victim's case. In the early evening hours of March 16, 1994, Riverside County investigators took suspected serial killer Dana Sue Gray into custody. She was taken to the Riverside Police Station for questioning. Inside the residence, investigators uncovered a wealth of evidence. They located a red-coiled key wristband, identical to the one stolen from Dorinda Hawkins at the antique shop. They also found merchandise similar to items purchased with June Roberts' credit cards. Inside Dana's purse, police made an ominous discovery. There was $1,900 in cash and a checkbook in the name of Dora Beebe. The address on the checks was from Sun City. Though Dora Beebe's name meant nothing to investigators, they knew that Dana Sue Gray had been in Sun City earlier that day. The search continued into the bedroom. Okay. What do you got? There, evidence technicians found a pair of Nike sneakers. The evidence was sent to the crime lab. Dana, you understand why you're here, don't you? At the police station, Dana Sue Gray appeared calm and unaffected. She denied killing or assaulting anyone. I think it looks exactly like you. She admitted using credit cards belonging to June and another woman, whose name she couldn't remember, but claimed she had found them lying next to a dumpster. You know what? Can I see those earrings? Investigators collected Dana's earrings which appeared to be the ones purchased on June Roberts' credit card. These look very familiar to me. As the detective left the interview to process the earrings, another investigator was waiting to speak to him outside. There had been another murder. The M.O. was identical to the Norma Davis and June Roberts homicides. The latest victim had been killed earlier that day in her home which was located in Sun City. Riverside, California police believed that the suspect in the murders of Norma Davis and June Roberts was finally in their custody. As they questioned Dana Sue Gray about the murders, detectives were informed that Dora Beebe, an elderly resident in nearby Sun City, had been found murdered. That crime scene bore the same signature as the other homicides in Canyon Lake. Detectives realized they had found cash and a checkbook in the name of Dora Beebe while searching Dana's house. Is there anything else you maybe want to Dana Sue Gray had killed again, just a short while before the surveillance on her began. And you found June Roberts' credit cards in the dumpster too. Now, 
they needed to be certain that she would never be free to kill again. At the crime lab, examiners analyzed the sneakers recovered from Dana Sue Gray's bedroom. They were size six and a half Nike Air sneakers, the same style and size as the print recovered from the Norma Davis crime scene. Analysis of the characteristics that distinguish one shoe print from another left investigators with little doubt that Dana Sue Gray's shoes had left the print in Norma's condo. Unable to explain away all of the evidence amassed against her, Dana Sue Gray had no choice but to confess to her crimes. Riverside County investigators believe that Dana Sue Gray was driven over the edge by her financial misfortunes that resulted from her divorce. Angry and envious, she chose affluent victims, sometimes strangers, but mostly friends and relatives, as targets for murder. To avoid the death penalty, Dana Sue Gray pled guilty to the multiple murders. She was given two life sentences without the possibility of parole. When I think of Dana Sue Gray, the first thing that comes to mind, for me anyway, is, is evil. It's just evil. There are usually patterns to serial murder, though they're often hard to detect. Only time, patience, and meticulous forensic science can delve into the unknown and finally bring them to light. But ultimately, that's what detectives need to stop the killers who are driven by bloodlust. Police in Northern Oregon are overwhelmed by a string of brutal murders. At first glance, the cases appear unrelated. But as victims continue to surface, the investigation begins to expose a more terrifying truth. A quiet town in Central California becomes the backdrop of a violent double homicide. With no witnesses and little physical evidence, investigators struggle to identify a suspect. To make their case, police must rely on determination, ingenuity, and a little luck. When death comes at the hands of a stranger, investigators depend on the physical evidence to make their case. Forensic science offers the only hope of justice when innocent victims are caught in a killer's deadly aim. Dispatchers from the Hillsborough Police Department received a 911 call. A resident living along Cornell Road reported hearing multiple gunshots. Police arrived at the scene to find an abandoned 1966 Volkswagen Beetle pulled up onto the sidewalk. The car was riddled with bullets. Shattered glass, a purse, and traces of blood littered the front seat. Over a dozen bullet casings were scattered on the ground.
In the glove compartment, police found the vehicle's registration. The car belonged to a woman named Martha Bryant. A driver's license found inside the purse also belonged to her. But Martha Bryant was nowhere to be found. As officers tried to piece together what had happened, another call came in from police dispatch. Yeah, go ahead. Half a mile away, right, witnesses reported a woman lying bleeding in the road. The officer arrived to find paramedics frantically working to save the woman's life. He recognized her from the driver's license photo. It was the owner of the Volkswagen, Martha Bryant. She had been shot twice. The emergency team rushed her to the University Hospital in Portland. But after several hours of fighting for her life, 41-year-old Martha Bryant was pronounced dead. Later that morning, authorities contacted her husband. He couldn't imagine anyone wanting to harm her. He said that Martha was a dedicated midwife at the hospital where she worked. You want to hold? It wasn't unusual for her to be at the hospital well into the morning hours, helping families bring new life into the world. Martha Bryant just didn't seem to have any enemies. At autopsy, the medical examiner noticed signs that Martha Bryant had been sexually assaulted. A single nine millimeter bullet had pierced her lung. But it was an execution style shot from a 22 caliber weapon to her right temple that killed her. The slugs were removed and forwarded to the crime lab. Number four. 30 degrees. Okay. Criminalists at the Oregon State Police Crime Lab began scouring the Volkswagen for clues. Number one. Okay. Number one, 20 degrees. Trajectory analysis showed that Martha Bryant had driven through a hail of bullets. Number five, 30 degrees. Examiners determined that 17 rounds had pierced the car. The attack had come from two positions. From the right rear of the vehicle and from just outside the passenger window. It looked like an all-out ambush by someone determined like to kill her. Next, examiners compared the bullets collected from the vehicle to those recovered from the victim. They matched. And the markings left on the bullets told investigators that a Browning 9mm handgun had probably fired them. Examiners also confirmed that the fatal shot to the victim's head had been fired from a different weapon, a 22 caliber handgun. This suggested two shooters. With no motive and no obvious suspects, Hillsborough police believed this would be a difficult case to solve. Detective Michael O'Connell of the nearby Washington County Sheriff's Department was asked to assist in the investigation. It was extremely unusual, the, the, the extreme violent 
nature of it, the senseless, random nature of it. It was unlike anything that, that we had had, or in, unlike anything that had happened in the, even in the whole Portland metropolitan area. News of Martha Bryant's murder sent shockwaves through the community. The public came forward with dozens of tips, but they all led nowhere. Two months after the shooting, the Martha Bryant investigation ground to a halt. But Detective O'Connell refused to let this senseless murder go unsolved. Believing that Martha Bryant had been randomly targeted, O'Connell began reviewing another cold case he was working from a year earlier. That victim also seemed to have been targeted by a stranger. He began looking for signs that the two cases may be connected. On April 19, 1991, Washington County investigators were dispatched to the home of an elderly Hillsboro resident. There, they discovered 62-year-old Margaret Schmidt. Get in that angle there. She had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and then suffocated with a pillow. The only piece of evidence recovered from the scene was a man size eight and a half Reebok sneaker print left in some spilt talcum powder. The subsequent investigation into Margaret Schmidt's murder had uncovered no solid suspects. Margaret Schmidt had no enemies, led a very quiet lifestyle. Um, there were no actual witnesses that night to this person sneaking into her house. Other than the shoe prints, we had nothing else to go on. After reviewing the case file, O'Connell could find no similarities between the two murders. The MO in each was radically different. The only thing that Martha Bryant and Margaret Schmidt shared in common was that both appeared to be unlikely victims. Still, investigators at the Washington County Sheriff's Department needed to find a way to close these two investigations. And their caseload was about to increase. Two months after Martha Bryant's murder, a passing truck driver spotted something on the side of the road. As he got closer, he realized he had found the lifeless body of a young woman. He immediately called the Washington County Sheriff's Department. Detective Scott Ryan received the call. The information that we had at that point uh, was not specific. Uh, the people on the scene did not know if it was the victim of a hit and run or if the body had been dumped for some other reason. When officers arrived at the scene, they found that the victim had been shot at point-blank range from underneath her chin by a 22 caliber pistol. She had also been badly beaten and sexually assaulted. But other than the bullet used to kill her, no physical evidence was recovered. Investigators had no idea who this woman was or why she had been murdered. Hoping to identify her, the victim's fingerprints were run through the police database. They got a hit. Records indicated this victim had been charged on a minor violation a few years earlier. She was identified as 23-year-old Shanti Woodman of Portland, Oregon. Detectives interviewed Woodman's friends, but no one had any useful information. She was known as a free spirit, and everyone fully spoke with liked her. Like the Margaret Schmidt and Martha Bryant investigations, the murder of Shanti Woodman quickly threatened to go cold. To keep the number of unsolved murders from growing higher, 
Washington County authorities organized a task force comprised of officers from area law enforcement agencies. The difference in the ages of the victims and the different MO in each murder led the team to conclude these cases were unrelated. And though a 22 caliber handgun had been used in two of the murders, examiners at the lab concluded they were different weapons. For the next several months, police followed hundreds of leads in each of the three unsolved cases. But despite their efforts, little progress was made. And then, new reports of violence began to pour in. The normally quiet community of Hillsborough seemed to be caught up in a deadly crime wave. As police in Hillsborough, Oregon struggled to keep pace with the growing number of unsolved homicides in their community, a new rash of assaults were being reported. Investigators learned that two elderly women had been attacked in separate incidents. Police spoke with one of the victims who was still recovering in the hospital. She said a man came to her door asking to use a phone. Once inside, he attacked her. But the woman managed to activate an alarm pendant. The assailant panicked and fled. The woman was certain that her attacker was a man who used to live in her apartment building. 30-year-old Caesar Baroni. The second victim was also able to identify Baroni as her assailant. A warrant was issued for his arrest. Investigators quickly tracked Baroni to a local bar. He was placed under arrest for the two assaults. Unlike the unsolved murders of Margaret Schmidt, Martha Bryant, and Shanti Woodman, it seemed the latest rash of violence would be quickly resolved. At the weekly task force meeting, Detective O'Connell learned about Baroni and details of the recent assaults. Baroni had an extensive felony record which included a number of assaults and rapes on elderly women. As he continued listening, Detective O'Connell realized that the M.O. of the recent assault bore striking similarities to one of the unsolved murders, that of 62-year-old Margaret Schmidt. Right away, we're speculating, could he be responsible, at least, at the very least, for the murder of Margaret Schmidt? because of the age of these victims that survived and the fact that the one victim lived only a block away from Margaret Schmidt. Though it was only a hunch that the cases may be connected, detectives interviewed Baroni in jail. He claimed he had never heard of Margaret Schmidt and denied any involvement in the recent assaults on the elderly women. Having been positively identified, Investigators were convinced that Baroni was lying. Looking for any useful information, they asked him if he owned any weapons. To their surprise, he admitted to owning several. One, he said, was a Browning 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Investigators had been searching for the same type of gun in connection with the shooting death of 41-year-old midwife, Martha Bryant. The hunch that Baroni was connected to the murder of Margaret Schmidt had uncovered a possible link to another unsolved case. Looking for evidence that could tie Baroni to the two murders, police obtained a warrant to search the house he shared with a roommate showed up at the same time as the night. The man led them to Baroni's Browning 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Let's 
Go ahead and take this one. We sent that gun in to be test fired and compared to the Martha Bryant ballistics evidence. But at that time, it was only a hunch. There was nothing that directly led us to believe that he killed Martha Bryant. Police continued searching for evidence that could tie Baroni to the unsolved murders. In his bedroom, they found another potentially vital clue. A pair of Reebok tennis shoes, the same type of shoe that had left the print at the Margaret Schmidt crime scene. At the crime lab, examiners analyzed the shoes recovered from Baroni's house. They were determined to be Reebok ERS tennis shoes, size eight and a half. Examiners overlaid Baroni's shoes onto transparencies of the print lifted from Margaret Schmidt's house. The unique characteristics present on the treads of Baroni's shoes were identical to those found at the crime scene. Examiners concluded that Baroni's shoe had left the print. Speculating that they had inadvertently exposed a serial killer, investigators turned to the gun recovered from Baroni's house, the one suspected in the shooting of Martha Bryant. Criminalist Chris Johnson fired the Browning 9mm weapon into a water recovery tank. Under a comparison microscope, the samples were compared to the 9mm bullets recovered from Martha Bryant's lung and from her Volkswagen. Detective O'Connell was contacted and given the results of the analysis. Chris Johnson test fired that Browning 9mm pistol and determined that that gun and that gun alone had fired those bullets removed from her Volkswagen and had ejected those casings found along Cornell Road to the exclusion of any other gun in the universe. It was an absolute solid positive match. Though it was powerful evidence, it didn't prove that Baroni fired the fatal shot, Let's check out the other side. which had come from a different weapon, a 22 caliber pistol. As police searched for that gun, they got a break. An inmate locked up with Baroni came forward. Let's see this guy. The inmate said Baroni had been bragging about the murder of Martha Bryant. Baroni told the inmate that he was the lone gunman. He had used the 9mm to shoot up the victim's Volkswagen and then the 22 to deliver the fatal blow. You know, like he's a bad criminal And that wasn't all. Baroni had bragged that he and another man had committed yet another murder several months before that had remained unsolved. The details of that homicide also sounded familiar to investigators. Detective Scott Ryan reviewed the inmate statements. One of the cases that Mr. Baroni had described to the inmate was a case of a female who was uh, picked up in Portland, transported out west, and uh, raped and murdered. There was only one case that that could be consistent with, and that was the death of Shanti Elise Woodman. The investigations into three seemingly unrelated homicides were converging, exposing a trail of murder that led to one serial killer. Now, police needed to find hard evidence to make sure that Caesar Baroni would never be free to kill again. Having conclusively tied suspected serial killer Cesar Baroni to the unsolved murder of Margaret Schmidt, 
Police in Hillsboro, Oregon now sought to link him to the murders of 41-year-old Martha Bryant and 23-year-old Shanti Woodman. Baroni's alleged accomplice in the Woodman murder was tracked down to a local jail where he was serving time on an unrelated charge. Nothing, huh? Perhaps you might be able to tell me what you're... At first, Leonard Darcell was uncooperative. But after being confronted with the inmate's testimony, he decided to talk. Darcell told the detectives that he and Baroni had met Shanti Woodman in a Portland bar the night she was killed. They conned her into Baroni's car. Once inside, Baroni beat and raped her. Then they drove her to a remote location. Darcel told police he begged Baroni to just leave her alive by the highway. Get down, get down. But Baroni shot her anyway, using a 22 caliber pistol. Though police were getting close to making their case, they needed to find the weapons used in the Martha Bryant and Shanti Woodman murders. In the course of interviews with Baroni's acquaintances, the police learned that he had scattered guns all over town, leaving many with ex-girlfriends. Police tracked down and collected several of these weapons including a number of 22 caliber pistols. The weapons were forwarded to Chris Johnson at the Oregon State Police Crime Lab. Before the test firing, however, Johnson decided to first swab the barrel of one of the weapons that was consistent with the gun used to kill Martha Bryant. We knew that the head wound to Martha Bryant was a contact near contact and that with a gunshot wound you can get high velocity blood spatter. We swabbed the outside of the barrel and the inside of the barrel first before we test fired it to check for back spatter. We were able to find blood inside the barrel. DNA testing showed the blood on the inside of the gun barrel was consistent with blood recovered at autopsy from murder victim Martha Bryant. This was the link needed to prove that Baroni's gun delivered the fatal head wound. Examiners at the crime lab were also able to conclusively tie another of Baroni's 22 caliber guns to the murder of Shanti Woodman. Some detail. This is the test In all, Oregon authorities had linked serial killer Cesar Baroni to three unsolved murders. Detectives marched into the Washington County Jail and charged Cesar Baroni with the murders of Margaret Schmidt, Martha Bryant, and Shanti Woodman. And also with the assaults on the two elderly women. Based on the evidence, police believe that Baroni constantly prowled the area, searching for vulnerable women to abduct, molest, and kill. Though he targeted elderly women, anyone who crossed his path was a potential victim. Not only had he gone after so many elderly people that should have had some type of peace in their later years, but he'd uh, performed some very terrifying attacks on, on some people that were just totally unsuspecting as to what a predator he really was. Caesar Baroni stood trial for the murders of Martha Bryant Shanti Woodman and Margaret Schmidt. In all three trials, he was sentenced to death. For his involvement in the Shanti Woodman kidnapping and murder, Leonard Darcell was sentenced to 20 years without the possibility of parole. Serial killer Caesar Baroni waited until his victims were alone before attacking. 
other killers strike whenever the opportunity presents itself. Atascadero is known as a small, peaceful town nestled in the foothills of California's beautiful central coast. But a handgun will shatter the tranquility of any town, and Atascadero is no exception. In the early morning hours of February 5, 1987, police and paramedics were dispatched to an apartment complex. There, they discovered the body of a young woman lying on the sidewalk. She had a single gunshot wound to the left temple. The emergency team also removed a nylon stocking that had been used to gag the victim. As crime techs fanned out to search the area for evidence, police began interviewing residents at the complex. They identified the woman as their neighbor, 22-year-old Lori Rainwater. They said that they had rushed outside after hearing screams, followed by several gunshots. But because of the fog, they couldn't see anything clearly. They had no idea who could have done this. As the search for clues continued, police discovered another victim at the rear of the building. He was dead the victim of a gunshot wound to the chest and an execution-style shot to the back of the head. He had also been gagged with a stocking. Neighbors later identified him as Laurie's husband, 25-year-old John Rainwater. Police made their way to the couple's apartment. There, they discovered that the bedroom was on fire. This killer had gone to great lengths to obliterate any trace of himself from the crime scene. Police in Atascadero, California, continued searching for clues in the double homicide of John and Lori Rainwater. After extinguishing a fire that had been deliberately set inside the couple's apartment, police began processing the scene. Blood spatter found throughout the apartment suggested a vicious attack. No fingerprints were discovered. Police did find evidence that the murdered couple had been bound. Yards of duct tape used to bind them were recovered. They also found two makeshift mittens made from socks wrapped with duct tape, probably used to keep the victims from loosening their bonds. As the search continued, police noticed two empty jars on a table. All of the items were collected and sent to the crime lab for a closer examination. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that each of the victims had suffered deep, blunt force lacerations. There were also signs that they had been sexually assaulted. But it was a 38 caliber gunshot wound to the head that killed both John and Lori Rainwater. The recovered slugs were forwarded to the California Department of Criminal Justice Crime Lab. As examiners started processing the evidence, investigator Bill Hanley of the San Luis Obispo County DA's office began looking for leads. With no eyewitnesses to the double homicide, there were no immediate suspects to pursue. The homicide occurred at approximately 6 a.m. It was a very uh, 
foggy, dark morning, uh, which hindered eyewitnesses' ability to uh, see anything clearly. With little evidence to go on, investigators turned to the victims' families for information. Mrs. Martinez, Lori Rainwater's mother, could not imagine anyone that would want the couple dead. She said that John and Lori were a happy and deeply religious couple. They worked several jobs, one of which included taking care of the apartment building for their landlords. They carefully budgeted their money. In fact, they had recently saved enough to move to a bigger apartment in order to raise a family. Mrs. Martinez said Lori had stored their savings in small glass jars. Investigators realized that those jars had been found empty. The information led investigators to theorize that robbery was the motive behind these savage murders. They hoped the evidence could tell them more. The duct tape and the empty jars believed to have contained the rainwater savings were analyzed by latent print examiner Marty Collins. An inspection of the jars, however, revealed no signs of fingerprints. Next, Collins turned to the duct tape. But the tape was stuck together and crushed. Once you get the tape that is stuck together, although there are ways to try and take it apart, the uh, chance of getting latent prints is greatly diminished. Traditional methods of locating and raising a print were unsuccessful. But Collins had one technique left to try, a dye staining process. After applying the chemical rhodamine 6G to the tape, a laser light was applied to the evidence. The dye adheres to any latent prints present on the tape. Under the light, a small section of a fingerprint emerged. But the discovery was not that encouraging. Collins realized that this evidence could not be compared to prints already on file. The print from the tape was from high up on the tip of the finger, not on the pad of the finger where inked prints of suspects are taken. Over the next few months, police developed several suspects. They were all brought in for questioning but eventually, fingerprint analysis eliminated all of them. For Detective Hanley, it seemed that the investigation into the deaths of John and Lori Rainwater was at a standstill. Due to the high publicity of the case, for approximately the next two and a half months on a daily basis, uh, up to 16, 17 hours a day, we ran down leads. Uh, these leads were from different parolees or uh, offenders in the area to people calling up and saying that they believe that their neighbor did it, although having no really proof on it. All the leads that we had run into uh, came up to be dead ends. But then, on April 29, 1987, two months after the murders, police received a phone call from a woman who claimed to have information about the rainwater homicides. She agreed to come in and answer questions. The informant said that she had met the Rainwaters a few days before they were murdered. While looking for an apartment, she and her boyfriend, Dennis Dwayne Webb, had spoken with them. The Rainwaters explained that they only collected rent money from the tenants for the landlord. 
they didn't actually rent out apartments. But while in the apartment, the informant noticed that her boyfriend was constantly glancing at the money jars on the kitchen counter. For investigators, the story hardly proved murder. But there was more. She went on to say that a week or so after meeting with the Rainwaters, she and Dennis Dwayne Webb were arrested in a drug raid. Police had collected drugs and several weapons, but failed to find a hidden 38 caliber pistol. Having followed the double murder investigation in the media, the informant knew that was the same type of gun used to kill John and Lori Rainwater. The informant was released on bail the following day. Shortly thereafter, Webb called her from jail. He wanted to talk about the hidden 38 caliber handgun. She advised me that at Dennis Webb's insistence that she was to dismantle the gun, take it to the coastal area in California and throw it off the cliff into the ocean. The informant did as she was told. After taking the gun apart, she drove to a remote area along the coast and threw the gun over a 300-foot cliff. After months of having no solid leads, police now considered Dennis Dwayne Webb as the prime suspect in the murders of John and Lori Rainwater. But to make their case, they needed to locate the murder weapon. And after viewing the area, investigators were not optimistic. Frankly, when I went there and noticed where she did throw it off, I thought there was little or no chance of ever recovering that weapon again. Members of the search and rescue team from the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Department were brought out to the site. After surveying the area, the team meticulously mapped out their mission. They double-checked all of their equipment to ensure their safety, and then geared up. It was now up to them to rappel down the perilous cliff and search the beach below for the weapon believed to have been used to kill John and Lori Rainwater. As investigators in Atascadero, California, continued searching for evidence in the slayings of John and Lori Rainwater, they finally got a break. An informant admitted that at the instruction of her boyfriend, Dennis Dwayne Webb, she had thrown the murder weapon off a 300-foot cliff into the Pacific Ocean. Though finding the weapon seemed like a long shot, the search and rescue team slowly made their way down the sheer cliff. Because of the treacherous conditions, it took the two-man team nearly three hours to reach the bottom. Once there, they began searching for the gun. For over an hour, the search turned up nothing. But then, under some rubbish, they found what appeared to be the frame of a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. Though it was badly damaged, police believed they had found the murder weapon. The team made their way back up the cliff and turned the gun over to investigator Hanley. For him, its value as evidence was questionable. 
looking down the barrel of this weapon, this was covered completely in rust. Frankly, I didn't think we were going to be able to get any type of ballistic help at all from this. Police sent the gun to the California Department of Justice crime lab. Technicians managed to reassemble and clean the gun enough to test fire it. The test-fired bullets were then compared to those recovered from John and Lori Rainwater. The markings left on the bullets as they traveled down the barrel of the gun matched in some areas, but not all. Investigators were building a good case but they were still a long way from proving murder. Police turned to their informant for help. They wanted to try and coax Webb into a confession. They asked his girlfriend to wear a wire and record conversations with him in prison. She agreed to cooperate despite the danger of being exposed. I'm convinced that the informant's motivation was only to see that justice was done. At no time during the investigation did the informant ask for any leniency on any pending criminal case she had, uh, nor did she ask for any type of reward that was out there. It was only to see that justice was done. During their conversations, Webb made no overt references to the murders. He believed that the correctional facility recorded all conversations. But when the informant told him she was worried that police suspected him in the murders, he began talking. But he spoke in code. Police were able to break it. For instance, when he referred to the weapon that was recovered off the coastline, he referred to that as a cat. Um, when he would talk about killing somebody, he would talk about popping grapes. It was that kind of code that we had to decipher. Webb assured the informant not to worry. In addition to discarding the murder weapon, he said he had made certain that none of his prints had been left behind. Though Webb's statements were incriminating, they fell short of a confession. But they were enough for investigators to obtain a warrant to search Webb's car. Underneath the driver's seat, investigators found a roll of the same type of duct tape found in the Rainwater's apartment. In the trunk, they found a receipt for the tape, stamped with the date and time, February 4th, 1987, at 8.37 p.m. The purchase of the duct tape had been made just hours before the Rainwaters were murdered. Though convinced that Webb was the killer, police still needed to physically link him to the crime scene. Because the print on the duct tape found at the scene was from high up on the finger, examiners were unable to match it to any of Webb's fingerprints already on file. But investigators were able to obtain a court order to get new prints, this time from the area high up on Webb's fingertips. Marty Collins of the Department of Justice Crime Lab performed the analysis. With the use of a uh, five power magnifying glass, I compared the photograph that I'd taken of the print on the tape with the inked fingerprints of Dennis Webb and until I found uh, the finger that was identified and I found a sufficient number of ridge characteristics to make the identification. 
the analysis proved that Dennis Dwayne Webb had bound the victims with the duct tape. The information was enough for investigators to charge him with two counts of capital murder. Investigator Hanley. Police theorized that after seeing the money in the Rainwater's apartment, Dennis Dwayne Webb began plotting to take it from them. A few days after that chance encounter, he returned to the couple's apartment and forced his way inside. Not only did he steal their savings, he also terrorized and tortured them for hours. When the couple managed to somehow escape, Webb chased them down and murdered them in cold blood. He then set the place on fire, hoping to destroy any evidence he may have left behind. On June 20th, 1988, Dennis Dwayne Webb was convicted of burglary, robbery, and two counts of murder with special circumstances. During the penalty phase of the trial, Webb testified and for the first time admitted his responsibility for the deaths of John and Lori Rainwater. After hearing his admission of guilt, the jury sentenced Dennis Dwayne Webb to death. Stranger-on-stranger stranger homicides are among the hardest to solve. But fortunately for investigators, killers always leave clues behind. They rely on forensic experts in the lab to help them solve the crimes and bring about justice when killers take deadly aim. <laughs>